Welcome to Global Considerations for Reopening Restaurants Industry Support Webinar, uh, given to you by the James Beard Foundation. Thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. Today's moderator is our Chief Strategy Officer, Mitchell Davis, PhD, uh, with special thanks to Monteverde Restaurant and Pastifico and Unilever Food Solutions and Magoo. Our panelists today are Jilly Haim, Corporate Chef of Unilever Food Solutions, Israel, Joanne Lamoanko, Corporate Chef, Unilever Food Solutions, Middle East, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, Chef Sarah Gunenberg, Chef and Partner of Monteverde Restaurant and Pastico, Chicago, Illinois, and Chef Tong, Chef Owner of Le Deux, Bangkok, Thailand. I'd like to give a warm welcome to our panelists and turn the show over to Thank you, Colleen. Um, thank you, Colleen, and welcome everybody. Um, I would say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on where you're listening from. I'm very excited um, to be participating in this um, webcam. Uh, someone might be uh, have some background noise and can mute. I'm just going to remind folks if you are not muted. Um, I would say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on where you're listening from. I'm very excited, um, to be uh, Colleen, if you could mute everyone until we're speaking, it would be helpful. Um, there's a spot. I want to say that this uh, webinar is part of a series of conversations that the James Beard Foundation has been hosting um, in service to a campaign that we're calling Open for Good. Um, we, the restaurant, I don't need to tell anybody listening uh, that the world is going through an unprecedented time in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has uh, had both personal um, public health and economic impacts that we will feel for a very long time to come. Um, especially in the restaurant and food service and hospitality industries, um, which uh, of, among many um, industries who've been decimated by the challenges faced in addressing this pandemic, um, have been hit harder and perhaps for more prolonged time than most. Um, restaurants around the world were forced to close before other businesses because of the nature of what happens there. People gather, they eat, they share food, um, they're served in close quarters, they celebrate. Um, they go on with their daily lives. And um, after the closing of restaurants, as the pandemic moved around the world, obviously, um, and, and the sort of curves of infection and various responses um, to the pandemic changed, um, and, and at certain places began to reopen, obviously, um, there were some lessons we thought to learn about reopening for restaurants here in the United States, but, but in different um, in different uh, different points on the, the life cycle of reopening around the world. And we thought this would be a great conversation to have with some of our friends um, who, who've been through or are going through uh, different stages of, of business, of dealing with the this global pandemic in the food service space. Before we get um, into the, the meat of the conversation, I just wanna say the foundation in the United States, the James Beard Foundation has been really key in this open for good um, campaign to to support restaurants and some of the questions that have already come in for people registering involve some details about public safety and things that you need to do and i would point folks to jamesbeard.org where you'll find um, some resources for you um, among many of the um, resources that are out there, but we're trying to aggregate and also standardize some of the approaches, um, taking the best information that we have from around the world. And we've partnered with a lot of um, sort of world-class global institutions on all of this work. Today's webinar is no different. And before I mention our partner here, I'll just say uh, we've worked with the Aspen Institute uh, to create a safety first guide, which you'll find on our website. We've actually worked with Zagat and the infatuation to do some consumer um, behavior behavior surveys about, about trust and confidence in eating out. And today's webinar is in partnership with Unilever Food Solutions. And the reason we have chosen to work with Unilever is because, of course, they're a company with 300 chefs globally. They're in 70 countries, and they have been able to um, service and deal with and um, re-service, I would say, uh, the restaurant industry and the food service industry uh, in countries 
um, at different phases of the, this pandemic, uh, literally around the world. So we're really um, happy to be partnering with them today. And we have two of the chefs from their 300 network um, from the Middle East calling in. And uh, I'll stop talking. Uh, I will, again, just point, if you're in the restaurant business and you're looking for resources, whether they're uni unique to the United States or global, do go to janesbeard.org. Um, if you're listening and you're a diner or you're someone interested in the space of food system change, I'd encourage you to come to the janesbeard.org and donate to this um, campaign as we try to support restaurants at every stage of the reopening um, the rebuilding and eventually to thriving. Uh, we know that the sector um, is as resilient and flexible as any can be, despite the economic and, and very real public health safety challenges that they're facing in this particular moment. And we're just very uh, proud to be an organization that supports the industry in the United States and around the world. Now I'll get to the introduction and then we'll get to the real meat of this conversation. Um, as Colleen mentioned, um, we have we have chefs from around the world uh, dialing in and I'll start with, with um, the, those coming from the farthest. Uh, chef Tan um, is a Michelin starred chef who cooked at the Beard Foundation in New York in October. Um, he ranked, currently, he has two restaurants in Bangkok, Ledu and Baan and one in Taiwan. And um, Ledu actually ranks number eight in the Asia's 50 best uh, chefs in the world. And he's calling in where it's evening or uh, late um, from Bangkok. We have uh, Joanne Lemonco, who is uh, with Unilever Food Solutions. She is calling in from um, the United Arab Emirates. She's been a corporate chef there for the Middle East, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, um, working with more than uh, 20 years under her belt in food service and in culinary arts. Um, from hotel, famous hotels around the world, and and currently now in the Unilever group, as I said. And we also have Gili Chaim, who's the corporate chef for Unilever Israel, not too far from the UAE. Um, also um, working, I think, in the, se the sector of innovation in food service, um, um, trying to um, figure out ways to create, uh, I think, uh, a global supply chain that is uh, both resilient and functions for the food service business. So. And finally, and last but not least, where it is earliest, Sarah Gruenberg, no stranger to the James Beard community. She's a James Beard award-winning chef of Monteverde in Chicago, but also um, I think um, going through a very immediate, just two weeks ago, started to reopen her restaurant there. And so um, Sarah uh, brings the, the, the smile of the Midwest and the, I think the experience of many chefs in the United States feeling right now. So I'm just going to ask each of you to, uh, be, and I'll begin with Tan, who you may not be able to see, but he's definitely, you can hear, to just uh, two minutes about your, your current businesses, your enterprises, and what's happening where you are vis-a-vis -vis restaurant reopening and, and the COVID pandemic, where you are in that space. Do you want to start, Tan, please? Uh, yes, yes. So everyone can hear me, right? Yes. 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 So it's been since uh, the lockdown in 23rd of uh, March that we have to close the restaurant, every restaurant in Thailand, including the bar, the pubs, nightclub and everything. And after that, we has uh, went through a very, I mean, tough um, period of time for our industry in, in Thailand, as same as in everywhere in the world. So many restaurants uh, who do the delivery, either they like it or not, including us as well. Because for, for me, we never actually believe in delivery, but, but we have to do it just because we have to keep the teams and, and we want to be ready when they let the restaurant reopen again. So just to give you the idea, when we change from you know the the dine restaurant to the delivery, the first month we our sale drop around eighty percent. So we have only twenty percent left of the revenue. I still keep all the staff. We pay half of the rent in Bangkok. Uh, you know, in the and that, and that kind of like a, how how is how is how is went on my first month and 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 for everyone in Bangkok as well and we just have the permission to open the restaurant again on the third of May but you cannot sell alcohol and we still have the curfew 
in Thailand, which is that mean that everyone have to be back home by 10 p.m. and which is you have to leave the restaurant by eight and cannot serve alcohol. So that means a lot of our revenue cannot be generated as well. And, uh, a lot of uh, unhappy guests they cannot, you know, drink in the restaurant and have a party. And with the social distancing um, policy from the government, I just reopened Ban, which is my casual restaurant, and we have to uh, reduce the number of the guests from 30 people to eight people, which is, you know, everyone in the restaurant industry know that that number, you know, doesn't add up and doesn't help the business at all and it's not cover any cost for now. And we still have like a breathing every month, but, but I still try uh, to keep the team together. And I still have another three restaurant, which is I'm not open yet. And I have to see how it's go from the government and I have to see the number. If the infection not not going up in Thailand, which is now is very good. We have only three new cases yesterday and then two two days of uh, zero cases. So let's see if it is still this way. I hope the government will lift the curfew and the alcohol ban soon. Thank you, Tan. I think a lot of people that what you've just described resonates with many people listening and, and dealing with restaurants across the country. Let's let's move back across the world and we'll go to Joanne. Um, tell us uh, your situation, what, what your enterprises that you oversee and, and what the state of affairs is for those. I'm sure there's a few different ones in your region. Yeah, so it's a it's a little bit um, different in my region because we just um, um, Ramadan was just celebrated like two weeks ago. So when that started, they kind of loosened up the, the curfew. Um, so from I think it was was about um, 8 p.m. They moved it up to 10 o'clock and then um, and then the mall started to open and restaurants were now accepting dine ins. But of course, at 30 percent capacity, um, people have started to go out because, you know, everyone has been anxious to go out. But they were we are still very, very um, cautious with everything, everything that has been happening. Because if you look at the news, um, unlike Bangkok, where in there's like zero or one cases, we still have about 700 new cases a day. And in total, UAE has about 22 something, 22,000 cases. But I think the big difference is that um, people in UAE, they're more confident in terms of how the government is handling um, the crisis. Um, We've seen a lot of news on social media going around, you know, how hospitals are handling it, how, how they've been doing mass testing, which is one of the reasons why um, the numbers are still up. It's just, you know, it's because of mass testings, but um, it's, it's, there's still a grim feeling. I think um, in UAE, it's a little bit more unique compared to other countries in the sense that most of the workers in the food service industry were all like expats. You know, we come here on work visas, and um, if we're not, if the restaurant closed down, we pretty much have a choice of either, you know, looking for another work, which is um, kind of grim right now, or go go back home to our countries. So it's a little bit tough, and as you know, living in the UAE is not cheap. Um, rent is pretty expensive. Things are really expensive. So it's a little bit, it's a little tough for the F&B, you know, worker. Um, but still, as a community, you'd see that there are a lot of support. Um, social media has been a big help. You'd see a lot of people um, posting about how they support local restaurants, how restaurants in return have been cooking for, you know, people who have lost work. Or we don't do much about, you know, um, donating food to frontliners because we have strict regulations when it comes to that. But who we support are mostly people who are not earning, who have lost their jobs. You know, um, so um, what I'm really proud of in this region is that they really stepped up in terms of, you know, as a, as an F and B community to help each other. But but it's still grim. Like um, I've asked I've asked other countries um, in the region that I'm handling, like how many percent of outlets do you see them um, closing or not reopening again? And most of them say it's about it's around 15, 15 to 20 percent are not opening. 
and a lot of restaurants have reduced their staff to about 30 to 50 percent and uh, they still don't know what's going to happen because as of today um, the government just released um, you know uh, new regulations were in you know from 10 p.m the curfew has now been um, they made it earlier so now it's until 8 p.m so we can't go out beyond 8 p.m and um, so again it's going to affect you know the the industry once again and our fines are heavier so I think that's what kind of makes things a little bit more disciplined in our region is because our fines are quite huge so people are really stay home they're worried and um, yeah they we pretty much follow the rules um, in other countries like Saudi I heard it's even more stricter and Egypt as well in Pakistan um, but um, in Saudis what's interesting is that the government has regulated the price of masks and gloves just as a support to the F&B industry. But in other countries, we don't hear much of this news. So a lot of owners, a lot of um, business owners are still worried, you know, how can they reopen? So that's pretty much the scene here in the Middle East. Right, thank you. It's so interesting to hear the different, um, uh, both the different um, cultural norms of sort of behavior, which we'll talk about a little bit, but also the different government responses, um, given the different forms of government. Um, um, so we'll talk about that also a little bit. Uh, Gili and Israel, which has been hit particularly hard, we understand from the news. Are you muted? I can't hear you. Okay, now it's okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay, hi. Um, I, I will start with the good news, actually. Uh, it seems that we are going back to routine, actually, in the last uh, the last few days. Um, we feel like the uh, this virus is the, the first, of course, the first wave is it's behind us. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people are getting sick anymore. Um, and... Uh, the restrictions are going low and low every day. We, are, we got a, a, an announcement from, from the government every day about uh, more restrictions that's going uh, uh, down. Uh, most of the kindergartens are open two days ago, which let most of the parents go back to work. Uh, restaurants supposed to be open next week. The, the, the original uh, uh, is supposed to be open in two weeks. So it's become uh, quite, um, quite fast. And of course, with limitation, with limitation of uh, number of sittings in the restaurants. Also, hotel is going to be open next week, even with spa and swimming pool, you know, with a limited uh, uh, number of people. And this is the good news I have to say. Uh, in the food business, quick service uh, places like falafel, shawarma, uh, I mean, quick service in the street, it's working very nice. Also, the pizza market uh, still running very, very nice about 10, 15 less from the normal uh, um, uh, cash, cash flow, but 10% uh, 10, 10, 10 less is, is quite nice. The big problem is the restaurant. Most of them, like maybe 50%, are not going to survive this uh, situation. Um, some of them are very happy to open this last week, first for um, uh, takeaway and delivery, but and, and next week for sitting also. But uh, I think it's it's not really help them because no no one can you know the, the expenses in Tel Aviv are very high. No, uh, I don't know a restaurant can survive with uh, 40, 45, 50 percent of the of the cash flow after two three months. They cannot survive. They have to pay the rent, normal rent, normal tax. Uh, actually, the, the 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 help of the government. It's really low. It's not like in Europe or in the States, I have to say. Um, it's a big shame for us uh, in Israel, but the Israeli government. But this is the situation at the moment. So uh, this is the uh, uh, not happy side of this uh, situation. Right. Uh, and Sarah, Chicago, it's a hop skip, our, our second home for the Beard Foundation. Um, tell us what's happening there. Uh, well, uh, our governor and mayor, uh, you know, released a kind of a phase reopening, I think is kind of common around the country. Um, Illinois is, and Chicago is still a, in a hot place. Um, some of the testing has um, increased, you know, we've had more testing, but there still is several new cases a day. It has not necessarily shown decline. 
uh, we're currently in phase two and restaurants reopening is phase I think four or five. So uh, we, we definitely have a long way to go. Um, a lot of restaurants though, a lot of independent restaurants have begun to open for delivery and takeout, um, which I think is a, a part of needing to get people back into work. And hopefully uh, with the additional help of the PPP loan has allowed some businesses to figure out how to navigate these waters. I'm sorry, uh, where and where are you and your restaurant at, in this moment, uh, in your restaurants? Yes, we just opened for takeout two weeks ago. Uh, we aren't offering delivery yet. It's still just curbside pickup. And um, we're open four days a week and we're located in Chicago's West Loop. Thanks. Okay, so that, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting overview. Lots of similarities, I'm sure some differences, uh, but but uh, everyone in the restaurant business, no matter where you are in the world, being hit particularly hard by this, this pandemic. Um, I have a few, in your introductions and in some of our previous conversations, we identified a couple of themes that I'd like us to just discuss, um, sort of, as you have something to contribute. I, I don't want to go question and answer for each one. I, I hope to try to facilitate a conversation. And I'll start where you just left off, Sarah, and where Tom began, which is the challenge of takeout for a sort of fine dining sit down restaurant because we hear a lot of people say oh you'll just do takeout you know that'll be fine you'll survive through whatever but but the realities are comp much more complicated than that whether it's the design of the kitchen the nature of the cuisine the 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 um what you need in order to successfully prepare food to go all that sort of stuff so uh, i'm curious if if the panelists would just um Get, add a little color to the the reality of turning from a restaurant to a takeout shop. Yes, okay, so so for us, um, we've kind of designed. I really tried to think what I wanted as a consumer during the shutdown and what ingredients would be available. So we created a market, a Monteverde Mercato, um, offering a lot of the great Italian ingredients and our fresh pastas that can be made at home and sauces, and that's been quite popular. It's also great to offer vegetables and um, ingredients from our local farmers that are rotating. And you know that was kind of a gamble, not sure how that would take off, uh, but it's surprisingly been very happily surprised very well. And then also offering a few kind of bake at home options. So a lot of the prep work is complete, but the um, the diner or the the cook at home can have the feeling of of finishing a dish, which I think is 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 becoming more popular. Um, and then we're also offering a, a limited hot food menu. Uh, I would say that I kind of joked about it yesterday. It's like running a restaurant is one thing, and that this is totally different. You know, you can be prepared, but I feel in many ways like a chef toddler in a way, like I'm finding my fitting, I'm trying to figure out how to execute, and and even now productivity and costs is even more, more of a concern. So navigating all of that together. Um, you and mentioned something about volume of production in this environment. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about that? Well, when you take out your beverage sales, <laughs> you're now producing so much more food and you need so much more people. And it's it's been very, very challenging, I would say, to figure out the volume. And there's really no history to go on of how much to prep and how much to prepare. Um, so it's been, it's really kind of a give and take. You know, Mother's Day was our first Sunday and was really hard, really, wow. really hard. And, you know, you got to try to find a way to, to bounce back. Tan, how about you? Uh, specifically, what did you need to do to reimagine your menu as Thai takeout from the beautiful restaurants that you operate? Yes, so for, for Ledoux, which is more of the fire dining side, we we did uh, we did the fire dining. I mean, we're doing the fire, uh, we're doing the delivery right now, but then we do it as a, a la carte because usually the uh, the Ladu, we have only the set menu, but then you cannot actually serve the set menu on delivery or takeaway. So we, we adapt ourselves to sell the a la carte instead, which is work quite well, I would say in the first, you know, month. And then, I mean, the sale, 
cannot compare with with the sale when we actually have the, the normal restaurant but it's help is pay the staff which is we keep all the staff but then we pay them you know day by day you know not not the whole salary but everyone happy that they keep the job and then and then we we help each other out you know as a family but but the the revenue let, let's let's talk about the revenue from from outside in in bangkok we the the average uh sale that we do every day in the delivery delivery is compare when we open the normal restaurant usually is compare only like a six days i mean like a one day that we we do the delivery is you know only seem like a, only six people die into your restaurant wow. that, that how much the cost is and 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 how how, how bad the the situation of, of the delivery for the fine dining in bangkok which is many restaurants in bangkok not choose to do the fine, uh, the fine dining delivery thanks uh, we've heard a little bit about the government response to the pandemic but i'm wondering um, from each of your uh, purchase let's say um has there been specific government response in support of restaurants who uh, or the hospitality industry in any way. Here in the United States, we helped create an organization called the Independent Restaurant Coalition, which is lobbying in Washington to, to make sure that some of the government stimulus and, and other um, help is, is designed in a way that it's useful for restaurants because as everyone knows, they're unique small businesses in the world of small businesses. So I'm just curious, if there has been positive government support for the particular situation you find yourselves in, um, even the re relaxing of liquor laws in certain places to allow for takeout um, cocktails, whatever it is that you might I imagine UAE doesn't have those, but it, has there been a recognition of the unique situation restaurants and hospitality find themselves in where you are? Anyone? Well, there's there's nothing specific to the F and B industry, but. Um, generally, the UAE government, um, you know, uh, on the onset, they have um, communicated that um, landlords should ease up on the rent, and, um, and people should be um, business owners can can talk to their um, to their banks um, on a case to case basis. Um, there's no like and mass communication that you know they, that that they can pay less or they don't have to pay at all, but they do offer these options wherein they can approach banks, you know, in, individually and, you know, discuss how they're going to pay their loan. And um, yeah, nothing really specific to the FNB, but um, they have eased up um, a lot of um, payment options, but but still, you know, it's it's still difficult for a lot of people. If you're not earning anything, you know, even if the if the payment scheme is easy, there's nothing for you to give so it's it's still it's still quite a challenge for a lot of people really in israel have they acknowledged yeah, the I restaurants have say, i have to say it is not really uh, nothing really happened of course the government they're talking about restaurants support the hotels especially the chains and there is a, a restaurant association that is a, a, a negotiation with the government but till now only only talking nothing really happened and the situation is very very bad especially for the small business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sarah? Very similar to, you know, I think the government in Illinois is, is still trying to figure out how to get restaurants to open. Um, there are small groups of restaurateurs getting together to try to go to Springfield and, and see if we can see some change. It's, it's so dependent, there's so many layers, you know, in our government with national and state and even citywide. Our, in Illinois, for example, the cases are really in Chicago. There's there's some cases in Illinois, but the, the hub is Chicago. So I think Chicago might have different um, reopening rules and support than in the state. Finding that in New York too. Tan, what about in Thailand? Does the government recognize, I mean, as an outsider, we think uh, that Thailand or Bangkok is just one large restaurant for us. Is there any acknowledgement of the unique hardships the industry is facing there? Uh, yes, we we try to you know as a industry we try to seek for the government uh, help as well. 
but then uh, I would say nothing much, you know, specifically for our industry, you know, I mean, what, what they can do for everyone, basically it's like a social, uh, social security, which is they pay minimum wage for everyone if you cannot open the restaurant. But then, you know, that, that, that doesn't help so much because the minimum wage here is very low. Uh, the minimum the minimum wage in Thailand is three hundred dollars US dollars a month. That is kind of like a almost nothing for some people, you know. And then for for my staff, for my sous chef, for my managers, for my live cook, they they make much more than that. And then to to only give, you know, to only get that much help from the government is almost like a, you know, a suicide, you know, to, to have to live in Bangkok and still working and then get so little money to live, to live in, you know, it's kind of like a, maybe like a Dubai, you know, it's, it's when I mean, Bangkok is not expensive like Dubai or New York or Chicago, but, but we quite expensive to, compared to what, what we can get here as a, as a workers, as a less strong worker, actually, yeah. Right. So it's been very tough for, for my staff as well. I'm wondering, we've heard a lot about the interruption to certain supply chains that the pandemic has caused. And I think we, it's also revealed uh, sort of multiple chains that exist from sort of large contract global food chains, let's say, um, to regional farmers and the various resiliencies of those. Um, and then there's just the whole new world of PPE, to use the expression for gloves and masks. And so I'm just wondering if you have anything to share about shortages that you found. One of the questions has asked it specifically about takeout packaging, those sorts of things, when suddenly the world has, has changed and, and were the supplies ready for it from meat through gloves to takeout boxes. Any thoughts? I have to say that in inside everything is uh, really available, really. Okay. From uh, fresh food uh, till all these gloves and masks and everything is available. Prices are, are still high, of course, with uh, uh, specific, specifically uh, things. Uh, the issue is with the supply chain and suppliers that uh, there is no credit anymore. Uh, you have to pay cash Thank for it. One of the benefits of being so independently um, provisioned, usually. Yeah. Yes, Sarah, so for you found it really right. <clears throat> we found that um, you know lots of prices are increasing, uh, but we still have been able to support our local producers and local farmers. And um, really, it just kind of changes on a weekly basis what's available and not. Uh, we found that the nitrile gloves are. More comfortable to be wearing all the time uh, for a lot of our team and so those have now become short you know uh, and just a few things like that but there's there is plenty of gloves it's just you don't want to wear latex due to allergies and then the vinyl glove is great but the nitrile seems to be one of the more comfortable choices Let's see joanne how's the uae supply situation well, we just got off a, a call with, you know, with, with, with the whole Unilever organization and they were mentioning that uh, they're always closely monitoring, monitoring the, the borders um, because it will definitely affect um, supply chain. But so far, like in the UAE, only in, like in, um, when they started the lockdown, we, we heard about shortages in masks and gloves, but eventually um, the supply came through. But when I spoke to the restaurants, um, they were saying that whenever they do order, the distributor would put in a limit. So there, there, there is quite some, you know, discipline when it comes to that. So they can only um, put in X number of boxes for gloves and masks, depending on how large your establishment is. Um, but in terms of ingredients, yes, we do feel that um, some of the ingredients, the costs have gone up, especially those coming from Europe. Um, yeah, but but we do have a lot of um locally produced stuff as well so um in a way those prices are pretty much regulated actually i think you're muted yeah. i mean 
Thank you. Tom, uh, in Thailand, do you have access to everything that you need? Uh, yes, we, we do have the access to everything we need, the groups and the mass. I mean, because Thailand kind of like a start a little bit early, earlier, you know, the pandemics. So so we kind of like have everything in place. I mean, in, in March, everything is so expensive. You know, the price triple, quadruple, the mass and everything. But But now the situation is better. And I think we have the supply, all the groups and the mass and everything. But but then for for our supplier, our farmer, that I like a bit a big problem to them because we're using a lot of uh, small farmers. So when the restaurant, many restaurants close and all the hotel is closed, uh, this small farmer they they're losing a lot of orders. So meaning that you know they have to cut down their production, they have to cut down. Uh, staff, which is um, I'm I'm quite sad to see, you know. And then as a restaurant group, we we try to help them as well. So we team up with this. This is what we do in Bangkok, and just want to, to share with you guys. So so we actually turn, you know, we I, I talk with four or five chefs in Bangkok, and then we set up the the program called Market Food Box, which is meaning that we as a restaurant and the chef. We take the produce from our farmers, the small farmers, and then we we package it and then we sell it to our customer. Because when the lockdown happened, you know, I I noticed that people like to do the takeaway as well, you know, deliveries, but then people cook more at home. So we 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 in Bangkok we find a way to to help our farmers buy products to customer like a, you know directly you know without any any supermarket or any any you know anyone that take their profits so that that help as well you know to for, to give example you know now i i sold mangoes for my farmers who are supposed to export all this mango to hong kong and japan but then they cannot export it so they they was in a very big trouble. So I'm helping them to sell the mangoes to to my customer, which is this past one month. I helped them to sell four thousand kilograms of of mango to to my customer, and then that make them so wise for this year. And then I'm, I'm quite happy with that. So I this is what I want to share. About, thinking about Thai mangoes makes me salivate a little bit. Yes, <laughs> <me too. laughs> Um, that's amazing. And I do think it points to something that has become very clear and was perhaps almost invisible before this pandemic. And that is these, the different chains that get food from farmers to restaurants, from farmers to grocery stores, from farmers to food service operations and from farmers, um, to sort of local food markets. And they're, they're, they're pretty distinct and they're not so easy to, to intersect. So, I hear you hear a lot of stories about about a meat that has been contracted and can't be used for very it's growing too big all these sorts of things and is being destroyed when you also see people hungry um, and food insecure so I think uh, there's a lot of work to do there to both unpack perhaps um, untangle and and rethink the way those chains work I'm curious for all of you who are trying to implement, whether at the level of Unilever, one of the largest global food companies, or at a small restaurant in Chicago or Bangkok, when you're trying to implement um, precautions, both for your employees, for the dining rooms, obviously you're being mandated some of those, but even for preparing food and packaging it, and you're trying to be as safe as you can be, where are you looking for that input that that the standard if you will um, i mentioned earlier the beard foundation worked with the aspen institute here to step in and, uh, and we're offering some some standards based on the best information we have but what are the sources for for your individual organizations to know that you're to feel conf confident that you're doing things um in the safest way yeah. joanne why don't you start so we did a we did a, a webinar like a few weeks ago with Pulseberry, which is a, a local organization um, that does uh, food safety 
um, sanitation certifications. Um, and they were telling us that that, um, um, that the Dubai municipality is coming up with a new playbook in terms of you know um, new guidelines when it comes to reopening your restaurants, you know, post COVID. But you know, e every week uh, we get communications where in the government would um, say something on how restaurants should operate. So aside from the normal um, distancing and having those sanitizers um, present, um, they're also very strict in terms of 30% of the staff coming in. But to your question, like how can you guarantee? I think everything is uh, is still a risk. Like last night, I just heard like a friend of mine got got COVID and um, he doesn't have any symptoms at all. So it's quite quite scary in the sense that you know even though you don't display symptoms, you, you can function normally. And and um, that's uh, that's a huge risk for people working in the food industry, um, especially especially you know people working here, they, they come and go, right? Um, they live in accommodations, you know, they're different, they live in different places. They don't shelter in in a restaurant, stay there and make sure that everything is, is safe. Uh, but then again, I think if we, you know, follow the strict regulations, um, make sure everybody washes their hands, making sure that everything's really, really sanitized and be very disciplined about it. You know, I think, you know, things will, you know, will, um, will will give more confidence to the diners to um to to dine out and, and and order food from you i think that's one of the biggest theme in china that's one thing that we've learned most of their communication it's all about um building more confidence for the diners to order it to order out and dine in your restaurant and a lot of their communications um it, it surrounds surrounds that message even here in dubai most of the ads that you see You'd see um, they're filming their kitchens, that all the workers are gloved, they're wearing masks, that they're packing food safely. Um, a lot of um, restaurants would um, show video clips that, you know, if they're if they're selling poke bowls, you know, this is how they pack it, how they wrap things, they would put ice on, on the bowl and it's delivered. So it's really about not only now communicating about food being tasty, but it's also about guaranteeing that the food is being prepared safely and it's delivered safely too. Sure. And a very interesting way on how restaurants are marketing themselves nowadays. Interesting. Sarah, what do, what do you consider a, a standard or what are you looking to when you're trying to re-set up a assembly line or even just um, sort of in your daily meetings with your staff to make sure, what, what, what's your source of insight information? Well, uh, we've been using the rest, the Illinois Restaurant Association um, and Serve Safe has sent out um, a bilingual video that all of our team has watched now on what to do and how to reopen. Um, you know, we're trying to be very communicate, like communicate with the team. You know, if you have any symptom, if you know anyone that has a symptom, you need to let us know. Um, hand washing is huge. Gloves are huge. Uh, also. The idea of washing, sanitizing, disinfecting, um, and knowing that those are different, um, that we all used to sanitize, now to disinfect is one thing. So we have a 30-minute a timer that goes off every 30 minutes for a sanitized, disinfect, and hand wash, mandatory for the whole team. Wow. Um, every week is something new. Every day, I, I joke. With my team, I said, I don't understand until I understand because it's it's every day your the light bulb goes on. Oh, this could be better. This is what we need to do. Um, I think it's you know the daily temperature checks we're doing for all the team members. Uh, it's it's pretty intense, and we I think there's more to do, and we're just waiting to find out. I think that also the the theme is do we really know also right? Like we right. need to. A lot of uncertainty, yes. There yeah. is some uncertainty also. Tan, what about you? Who's the source of, of the standard set of information? Is the government or are you going above and beyond? What yes, so have? of course the government have the rules, which is, um, I think it's very, very strict. And then that what we have to follow. And then we, we were happy to follow and but it's quite difficult for the because now we on the reopening stage because we two days ago the government just uh allow us to open the 
the mall again, the department store. So now everyone on a very, very strict uh, regulation from the government. I would, uh, I would tell you the example. Now, almost every restaurant, uh, department store and a standalone restaurant, you can sit only one people per table. That's how serious it is in, in, in Bangkok. And that what is the regulation from the government to all the restaurants in Bangkok. So it is kind of like a stupid, but then for, for us, but then we kind of like have to let's take what they give us. So, so then now, if you come out, if you come in to eat one bowl of noodles with your girlfriends or with your, with your daughter or your son, you have to sit in the table according to the government in, in Bangkok. And then that that's how it is right now in Bangkok. And and it's very stressful for for the restaurant to handle that as well. Because not only we're losing the customers, but then the customer is very unhappy with, with when 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 we tell them that they have to sit in separate table, they they're not happy as well. And then that what we're facing now in the first stage of the reopening in Bangkok. Um, I'm going to Gilly, I'm going to put you on hold for one sec. I want to pick up that theme a little bit because we've heard from a lot of restaurateurs across the United States um, that they're they're as concerned about the behavior of the clientele once they sort of bring them back into the dining rooms or even on lines for takeout. And I'm wondering if others have had an experience um, or or have noticed a resistance, as Tom mentioned, to these regulations, which are meant to keep both them and your employees safe. Yes. Actually, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't. I don't have a good answer for this. I have to say, uh, at the moment in Israel, because we don't open a restaurant for the for the. Okay. For, okay. So you were going to talk about standards, and then I'll ask the others that question. Were you going to say something? about the standard where you the source of the information uh, yeah. i say yes actually as as a global as a global uh, uh, company and especially in our uh, in israel uh, we create these clips uh, and digital course of uh, hygiene uh, we sharp the hccp uh, standard for our customers and uh, packaging and uh, all these uh, uh, hygiene standards everywhere that we are doing, I think, in most of the country, you can find it under UFS Academy courses in the web. Uh, this, this, this is the support that we give for, for our customers, actually. Thanks. Sarah, were you going to say something about the guests? Um, we had even heard that people stopped doing takeout at the early stages of the shutdowns because, because of the sort of behavior of folks who were clients, which is a difficult um line to to straddle in the world of hospitality where of course we're, we're all trained to um listen to the needs of the client and in this instance they need to listen to us in some ways yes I mean, we haven't even begun to really think about having people in because i think the reality for us is far it's not a, a close reality um but even people coming on foot like what's the concern if they ask to use the restroom the answer is no you can't come like we're not allowing anyone into the into the restaurant and, and that is a hard wow. uh hard thing to say sometimes but it's really you you have to set the boundary uh, we're, we're not accepting any cash tips um you know it, things like that that you have that you would never say no before but now i have to right um, we only have a few minutes left. I want to remind folks listening that you can shoot questions, I think, um, through the webcam um, mechanism. I've received a few, but if there are more, please let us know. Uh, and I want to spend the last few minutes um, sort of pulling out of the now, which is so hard to do because everyone is so in now. And let's look six months or even two or three years in the future. Um, I, I think we have this, this crazy... Um, almost paradox that that at this moment when it's so hard, I mean, grim was Joanne's word, it's really grim for restaurants. Uh, Gilly saying in Israel, it's just hard to imagine, you know, 50, I've heard 75% might close permanently. And yet at the same time, and we feel this very 
much of the Beard Foundation, people have woken up to the value of restaurants like they've never understood them before. It's, it's not just dinner, it's not just my birthday, it's actually sort of the cultural fabric of the city, of the street life, um, uh, this, even this nexus of the food system that, that all comes through the restaurant or the labor system the, that you mentioned um, in Dubai and in Thailand, the restaurant workers who represent so many different communities who come together and go back into the community. And so uh, I'm just wondering uh, if you could, if I could ask you to have a crystal ball, I know it's not an easy thing to ask. Give me your six month view and if you can, two year view, what, what you think is in store for this industry that we all love and work so hard in, even though sometimes we ask ourselves why, and especially these days. What, Joanne, why don't I start with you? What, what do you, what's your vision? Well, I'm very optimistic, uh, Mitchell, because um, we've seen it in China, we've seen it in, in, in Singapore, and we've seen it here in Dubai when we first opened the mall, when we first opened the malls um, two weeks ago, like people were excited to go back. I mean, they are cautious, but they are so raring to sit down in a restaurant. I've heard that this coffee shop um, offered, um, they were trying to sell freedom coffee the first day that, um, that the mall opened and people just, you know, lined up, you know, following social distancing rules. But the line was pretty long. So, and, and we've seen it in China, like one of our colleagues have mentioned to us that the first thing that people did when it opened up was to line up, line up for bubble tea, for milk tea, because it's something that they missed, you know, so much for so so many months. And um, I think um, as a community, we're still uh, we are raring to go back and support um, the the restaurant industry. I think um, um, if we were to predict, I think it's just a little bit challenging for operators because we need to follow rules, we need to follow regulations and it's going to cost us more, right? We're going to buy more gloves, we're going to operate, you know, at, at, at the very minimum and um, we ha we can't do buffets anymore, you know, conferences, meetings, um, expos will be will be set up very differently and these are such huge money makers for, for the industry, right? So I think at that part, the operations part will be you know, will be challenged, but on the consumer part, I think everybody will still be excited to go back and, you know, bring back the feeling of um, of dining out again. So sure. that's my crystal ball. <laughs> really? Yours? Yeah. Um, let's say I'm not optimist about this the, the, the short future for six months. I think in six months we are still deep in this economy uh, crisis. Uh, and it's going to be not easy at all, but as we know, uh, we still have a lot of crisis in this country years ago, and uh, people are, are very strong people uh, with a great vision to success. So in the, in the future for three years, I think everything is going to be uh, really fine again. And for this, I'm really optimistic. I'll, I'll skip to Thailand. Tan, what do, you, what do you think? What do you see in your crystal ball? Uh, so I think in six months, it will be uh, a survival mode for everyone, you know. Of, of course, you have to see Thailand as a very touristy destination. We rely on tourists a lot, and many restaurants rely on tourists. Um, there will be some restaurants that survive from the local guests, and then I, I will be honest with you maybe for my restaurant, two will be survive with only local customer but to might be not which is you know you can do do anything much but you know i think in 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 six months we will see you know a better trend of you know if is lifted i think people will go out the local people will go out but then we still cannot travel for a very long time i think at least you know i mean to be able to travel from Thailand to to Europe again, to US again, to Dubai again, that that will take some time for us. And then the restaurant, many restaurants have to learn how to survive without the international client, and and that will be tough for for many restaurants in Thailand as well, and I'm sure in many countries. So 
I'm quite positive that you know many of us will survive, but I'm not sure how many. I mean, not all of us will will survive, but I I, I hope for the best, and then I have to adapt to to attract and to get more attention from the local customer, which is we are doing now as well, you know, as a restaurant groups here in Bangkok. And I think if we can adapt and we can do that, I think we, we, we will survive. Yes, I'm still very positive. Okay, and Sarah, last to you. Chicago, will you be in phase four in six months, let's hope? Oh man, I, I hope so. I, I think we're all thinking 2020 will be the, the year of takeout. Um, and I hope that in two years, I hope that everyone has learned a lot and everyone is more kind and that we can all support each other and support the, the cultural hubs of our cities, which is our restaurants. Yes. Well, uh, we've reached time. I, I can't thank you all enough for so many reasons for taking the time to join us from around the world for sharing your unique um, perspective on things, given where you are and the folks that you connect with, but also um, for, for showing the world what we've known for a long time at the Beard Foundation and all of our friends and colleagues know in the industry that food people and restaurants are unique people in unique places and they're really important. And however complicated or complex and difficult the businesses are to run, um, there's a level of optimism and perseverance and flexibility and, and as we like to say, just get stuff done that I think the world has now realized and I hope will come back to everybody in spades, as you've all said. So so thank you again. Thanks for the hard work um, in this difficult time and for the positivity of what the future holds and the deliciousness that will be everyone's. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.